Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. We'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Jennifer Nezzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will speak with us about trends we're seeing in the COVID-19 data. Then we'll hear from Dr. Bill Moss, who is executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Jennifer, first to you. We're starting to see a substantially slower rate of new cases in the US and test positivity has started to, to decline. So does that suggest that we might, might be turning a corner relative to the Delta variant surge? Thank you, Lainey. Yes, um, we are seeing what appears to be a bit of a I will say, won't say slowing, but perhaps a slowing in the rate of growth in terms of the number of cases being reported in the United States. Um, we are still seeing increases in many states, um, but the rate of increase, then the percentage increase this week um, is slower and, uh, than previous weeks. And this is now the second week that we're starting to see that trend. So that is somewhat encouraging. Um, I do though have to say we should not um, be overly reassured um, by that. It's obviously we'll take any glimmer of good news we can get, but that shouldn't um, lead to complacency because we still are in very um, serious circumstances. Um, you know, just to put into perspective where we are today, um, the average um, daily case count is about 1400 times greater than what we saw in June. So um, this is, uh, we are um, seeing some signs of encouragement, but we're still in um, very serious circumstances um, compared to where we um, have previously been and where we'd very much like to be. And again, um, the majority of states are reporting, um, the vast majority of states are reporting sustained increases. So that is quite concerning. Um, same thing on the hospitalization front, hospitalizations um, are, appear to be slowing a bit in the sense of, of the rate of growth. Um, that of course is encouraging. We expect the hospitalization uh, trends to lag a bit from the cases. Um, similarly, um, deaths are still uh, being reported and deaths are probably one of the slower indicators to change. Um, but this week we saw uh, more than 20% uh, more deaths um, than uh, last week. That's kind of, um, kind of uh, bump up and down each week, but um, we'll expect it to be several more weeks of, of probably con very concerning numbers before, if there is in fact a sustained slowing of the case growth before we start seeing that um, turning up in deaths. Um, positivity test testing, uh, you know, again, there's some, some encouraging signs in terms of the, the fact that the test positivity um, is starting to um, uh, plateau or perhaps even um, decrease. That said, I have some um, deep concerns uh, that remain about testing. The first one is the overall national test positivity is still far too high. It's uh, over 10%. We haven't been at 10% since really the, the worst of the winter surge. Uh, whenever I see positivity that's not, that's high, it's always a um, you know, a glaring warning that we are not doing enough tests to find the number of infections that are likely out there. We need to be casting a wider net. And on that front, there's a number of, um, you know, worrying same uh, trends that are being reported. One is um, we're starting to hear more and more about testing delays and people waiting uh, too long in order to get their test results. Um, if test results don't come back within, you know, 48 hours at the most, uh, the impact of that testing result is greatly diminished. Um, we're also hearing about um, some reports of potentially um, supply shortages and including um, they're apparently in, in um, several parts of the country, um, it's been harder to find rapid tests 
presumably because of increased need for people to test, but also perhaps um, people are turning to rapid tests as a uh, more expedient way to get test results than, um, than laboratory-based tests. We know some, um, uh, some places are actually rationing um, the, the sale of these rapid tests. Uh, I think what this tells us is that there remains a great need for people to test, and we very much need to put some attention to um, our testing infrastructure and make sure it's adequate, um, not only to deal with the case numbers that we have now, but potentially the case numbers we could have. Though we're seeing a uh, perhaps a slowing in the growth of cases, this is by no means necessarily permanent. If we start changing behaviors, say we reopen schools and we start gathering and we do more of um, what we were doing before, um, we could potentially see the case numbers go up again, and we want to make sure the testing infrastructure is adequate to handle that. I'll also say if there is evidence of increased utilization of rapid tests, um, that's great. It's good for people to, to have access to tests and be able to get test results so they can take actions to protect themselves or their families, but also be aware of the fact that those test results are likely not getting captured um, by our, our COVID tracking systems, our, our public health surveillance. And so um, as we kind of push more people um, to testing in those environments, um, that just could skew our, our COVID numbers. Um, and then the last thing I'll just uh, reflect on is the worldwide situation. Again, if you look at the global numbers, it appears to be plateauing or decreasing. My very strong sense is that's likely due to the slowing of cases in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Um, has been accounting for about a, a, a fifth of the, the global cases. And in fact, um, three U.S. states, uh, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Florida have more cases um, than um, all, nearly all other countries uh, are reporting uh, right now. So um, when we start to see a slowing in the U.S., it will have an outsized um, effect on, on the global case numbers, um, but we should not take away from that that um, the global situation is getting better. In fact, there are just many countries um, that continue to report um, deeply concerning uh, case increases. So we have to um, continue to remind ourselves that this is a global pandemic and that n none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Before I turn to Bill, I want to remind those who are watching to please submit questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. I'm keeping an eye, and I do see your, your questions coming in. We'll get to them soon. Bill, I'm going to now turn to you. We have one vaccine with full FDA approval in the United States, which is a wonderful development. Um, we also have a host of newly imposed vaccine mandates. What do you make of all of this for vaccine uptake? Right. Thank you, Lainey. And it is a good thing that we now have a full FDA approval for the Pfizer vaccine. That may sway some people uh, who were waiting for this full approval, those who kind of considered the emergency use authorization to, to still be uh, applying to a, what a quote experimental vaccine, which um, but we have a lot of evidence on the vaccine. So the, the full approval from the FDA is very good. As you pointed out, I think we're going to see a bigger impact uh, through the mandates and we're seeing increasing numbers of vaccine mandates, both in the private and public uh, sectors. So we are we are making slow progress, I'll say, in vaccinating the U.S. population, but we still have a long way to go. Um, right now, the seven-day average is about 800,000 people being, or doses being administered per day. This is certainly up uh, from what we saw uh, in early July when it was only about 435,000 doses per day, but far lower than the peak in early and mid-April of uh, close to 3.5 million doses per day. So we've seen an uptick in the number of vaccine doses delivered per day. Um, as we've seen this, the surge, the surge in, in cases that uh, Jennifer was talking about, I think you know this. It's hard to tease apart uh, what uh, is really behind this increase in the number of doses being administered per day. Um, some of it, I think, is being driven by fear, uh, as uh, people see uh, hospitalizations and deaths of those in their communities and their loved ones. As we've talked about at the Coronavirus Resource Center, you know, uh, it's unclear the way the data are collected whether some of these uh, uh, doses being administered now are actually unauthorized booster doses, where people are going out on their own and getting uh, a, a third dose or a booster dose um, uh, without the the explicit uh, recommendations uh, or approvals from the FDA and the CDC. I'll come back to that. 
But I want to say, uh, Lainey, just kind of reflecting on, on uh, kind of two broad aspects here, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the most egregious failures of our society, uh, one of our gravest sins as we look back at this, particularly during this wave, will be allowing hospitals to be overwhelmed. Um, we've overwhelmed the hospital staff. We're seeing uh, shortages in, in nurses and respiratory therapists um, and other hospital personnel. Uh, we've seen uh, limited bed capacity in hospitals and particularly in intensive care units and in, in a number of counties and states. We're seeing shortages of oxygen. And we should just not be in this place where, where our health system is overwhelmed now that we have you know, a fully approved and, but actually three safe and effective vaccines. That was more understandable in the winter surge when vaccines were just being rolled out. We didn't have the supply but this is impacting on people who don't have COVID and need healthcare services uh, for other reasons, for other diseases. And so I, I think this has been a, a big failure that we've allowed uh, in some states hospitals to be overwhelmed. I do want to just step back for a moment and, and talk a little bit about what we should expect from vaccines and, and, and because I think there's been some confusion around this and, and perhaps we haven't done as well in our public health messaging on this, but just very briefly, we have strategies to prevent infection and we have strategies to prevent disease, particularly severe disease, in those who are infected. Um, and vaccines fall in that second bucket. Um, our strategies to prevent infection include masking and, and social distancing and the other basic public health measures. So if people want to avoid being infected, that's what they need to do. Vaccines uh, prevent disease. Uh, they don't prevent infection. In fact, they can only start work, you know, their, their impact is only after the virus has entered our body. What the vaccines do is train our immune system to more rapidly and more vigorously attack the virus once it has entered uh, into our bodies. And I think we've created this kind of false hope uh, that vaccines are going to prevent infections. And I think part of that was driven by the by this change in the CDC guidelines around masking for vaccinated individuals. Um, but if people want to, uh, you know, if so we're going to see breakthrough infections. Um, what that, what's happening here is that um, there's, a, there's a race against time between our immune system and the virus. And for viruses like SARS coronavirus 2 that have a short incubation period, um, they, it may beat uh, the immune system uh, in terms of creating some symptoms. So I, I think, I just want to emphasize that uh, we, we need to be aware that vaccines don't prevent infection. They limit the viral replication once we are infected, and that will reduce, uh, you know, somewhat uh, the transmissibility or contagiousness uh, from a vaccinated individual, and will certainly uh, reduce the, the likelihood of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. We also shouldn't be surprised that after that uh, antibody levels wane over time, that too is part of our normal immune response. Um, uh, we can't maintain high levels of antibodies against all pathogens that we're exposed to. Otherwise our blood would be chock full of antibodies and wouldn't even be able to flow. So it's a normal process for antibody levels to wane. And it's also a normal immune process to see um, to see rises in antibody levels after booster doses. Um, so I just want to conclude by talking briefly about booster doses, um, but I firmly believe that decisions around booster doses should not be made on antibody data, although that's often being presented in the media. It needs to be presented or, or, you know, the evidence base for booster doses need to be, you know, how well the vaccines are holding up and, and preventing severe disease. Now, I know Dr. Fauci spoke about this yesterday, um, and he, he uh, referenced uh, two studies from Israel, um, one that showed a, a decrease in, uh, in infection after a, after a booster dose, another that uh, showed a decrease in, in disease after a booster dose. And so that that is, I think beginning to uh, accumulate the evidence base, but I think we still need more data to justify booster doses 
certainly for the general population. I can see it for uh, perhaps for the elderly who are at high risk of severe disease, whose immune systems are weakened because of their uh, extreme of age. That may be a group that requires booster doses. Um, healthcare workers may be another group just because we can't afford to have healthcare workers, even if they're uh, infected, even if they're out with just a mild illness, certainly don't want transmission in the, in the uh, healthcare setting. And I'll just conclude there are recent uh, news uh, being reported by the New York Times today that uh, the director of the, the FDA and the CDC are now uh, telling the Biden administration, the White House, uh, that uh, you know a rollout of booster doses for the general population by September 20th, as originally proposed, is is very unlikely. That they're not going to have the data. Um, they'll only have data perhaps for Pfizer um, and perhaps for some groups by the end of this month. So I, I, I'm, I think the Biden administration did get a little bit out in, fr uh, 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 in front of this story around booster doses. And I think there's gonna be a very vigorous debate uh, both within the FDA and uh, the advisory committee on immunization practices on the timing and the target population for booster doses. Oh. Before I turn to the questions that we've received from our audience, I want to remind everyone that you'll see a banner on your screen during this briefing. If you click on it, it will take you to sign up for our weekly newsletter, The Week in COVID-19, and that is a great way to get the latest developments on the vac um, vaccines, the virus itself, variants, and other critical trends delivered to your inbox on Mondays. I'm now going to move to questions that we've received. And since this, for many, is back to school week, I'm going to start, Phil, asking you a question about children. Where are we in terms of the timeline for vaccines for kids, both in that um, 5 to 12 age group and then the under fives? Yes, this is a really important question, Lainey. And, uh, you know, the timeline is still somewhat uncertain. What we're hearing is that uh, you know that Pfizer is is out in front on this. Moderna is a couple months behind, or uh, certainly a couple of weeks, if not months behind. J and J uh, even even further behind. So what we're talking about is with the Pfizer vaccine, we uh, we anticipate that Pfizer will have the data on the five to eleven year old age group perhaps by the end of this month early October, that would allow them to uh, apply to the Food and Drug Administration for authorization for the vaccine in that age group. Um, but that's but the FDA is going to need time uh, to review the data. One uh, the reasons why we're, we're, this is taking longer than many people want, and I understand that there certainly is urgency as children go back to school, is that the FDA is requiring six months of follow-up for the, tr the this group of children uh, as a opposed to two months of follow-up, uh, a median of two months of follow-up for adults. And the FDA asked for a larger sample size in these trials because they want to look very carefully at the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis, which we know is a very rare uh, potential adverse event uh, with the mRNA vaccines that was seen particularly in, in uh, young uh, adult males. Um, and so, you know, the what we're saying is that you know perhaps november december uh we hope by the by the end of this year we'll have emergency use authorization for of the pfizer vaccine for those five to eleven years of age uh, the younger age group, the two years to, to five years age group, which will be the next age group that's not going to happen until probably first quarter of twenty twenty two Thanks, Bill. And Jennifer, piggybacking on, on Bill's comments, given where we are with children and vaccines, what's your best advice for um, children who are unvaccinated because they're, they're ineligible as we head into fall and kids return to school? Well, um, first of all, it's all the same measures we've been using since the start of this pandemic, but crucially, the most important thing that we can do to protect children is to make sure all the adults in their lives are vaccinated. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about school, that means teachers and staff in school, but um, parents and adult relatives and really all the adults that interact with children, I think, um, you know, in, in making decisions about vaccines also have to con consider um, that that decision in part uh, in leads to the protection of, of 
children who are too young to be vaccinated. So that is absolutely critical. Um, and then, you know, in terms of school environments, the mitigation strategies that have been discussed and, you know, wearing masks and spacing and keeping good ventilation, um, not spacing at the levels that we um, were trying to do in the spring that was very difficult to um, return all the children to classrooms, but also just being mindful of, of space. And then I have to say that, you know, when we have had data about school outbreaks, they're very often tied not to school classrooms per se, but social events that are convened in and around school time. So kids are back to school, parents wanna throw parties, um, bringing those parties to crowded indoor spaces, um, really probably not a great thing to do in areas of high spread when you're dealing with, with unvaccinated children. So parents and community members just have to be mindful that um, returning children to school is incredibly important. And that makes means making choices in other areas to try to limit exposures so that we can try to keep children in school as safely and to do so as long as possible and to avoid the quarantines and, and, and um, shutdowns that um, have so far interfered far too long with our children's education. Thanks, Jennifer. And I'm, I'm going to stick with you. I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in about the Mu variant. So um, I'll ask you in, in general, we've been talking a lot about Delta for um, weeks or maybe months at this point. What other variants should we be keeping an eye on? Yeah, so people are keeping an eye on you. It's, um, I believe, still a variant of interest rather than a variant of concern. Um, that's just a kind of staging that WHO gives um, based on the availability of evidence regarding the level of concern in terms of its either enhanced um, transmissibility or abilities to evade um, available vaccines. And and right now, I think it's, it's in the category of things to keep an eye on, but I don't see strong evidence to suggest that we um, necessarily need to worry about it um, the rate of growth of Delta seems to far exceed that of um, this and, and other variants. So, um, of course, you know, this is why we do genetic sequencing of cases, and this is why we have to track these things so that we don't get blindsided. Um, but uh, so far, no particular evidence to suggest that that's um, more worrisome than, than what we're currently dealing with. Thanks, Jennifer. Bill, I'm going to turn to you for a question about um, vaccine eligibility for those who have had COVID-19. So for an unvaccinated person who's had COVID-19, how long should they be waiting until they get vaccinated? Yeah, so um, first of all, yeah, there is a lot of discussion about, um, or, you know, the, the current guidelines are certainly that, uh, that everyone who has had COVID should get uh, be vaccinated, and I know some people uh, raise that raise that issue um, because uh, it it is true that people who've had natural infection will develop an immune response. But as we talked about last time, uh, there's there's a great variability in the uh, immune response following natural infection, and we we know a lot more about uh, the vaccine response. Uh, after natural infection, uh, I'm sorry, after vaccination, um, and we know its its durability, and we know more about uh, its its level of protection. Um, and there is some evidence from the CDC that individuals who've had natural infection are at twofold higher risk uh, of acquiring a, a reinfection than individuals who've been vaccinated. Now, there well, it is recommended that the, that their uh, the vaccination be delayed uh, about a month after uh, after uh, natural infection. Thanks, Bill. And I'm also seeing a lot of questions coming in as we head into flu season about the, the timing of COVID vaccines with flu vaccines. Can you talk us through your thoughts about that? Yes, I, I uh, as uh, there is no, uh, so people should get uh, vaccinated against influenza. Um, that's going to be very important. Um, we anticipate that there could be a, a severe influenza season. We did not see that last year, fortunately, um, in part probably because of some of the, the public health measures that were put in place to control the transmission of, uh, uh, of uh, SARS coronavirus too. Um, but though, there's no evidence that those vaccines interfere with each other. Um, and so people should follow the, the standard guidelines on, on when to get the influenza vaccine. And it's uh, not determined by uh, the timing of the COVID-19, uh, their COVID-19 vaccine dose. Thanks, Bill. 
Jennifer, um, I have two questions for you, both that are close to your heart. The first is, what are your thoughts on the accuracy of the rabbit tests? Yeah, I mean, I think they have proven themselves. We now have a lot more data about their utility. Um, they have different performance characteristics for sure, but in terms of what we need them to do, they're um, quite useful and they offer a number of advantages. One, in terms of um, helping us to identify people who are most likely to be contagious, but also the fact that it can give us results um, that day <laughs> within minutes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of seeing delays for laboratory-based testing, that can uh, be enormously beneficial. There are some downsides though, in the sense I do really worry that we're not capturing results from those tests in, in much of our surveillance system. And I, I worry about there being this, this whole category of, of testing and, and potential positives that we're just not seeing to help us gauge how much of a problem we have. That said, on the kind of personal level, if that is what allows you to take protective action um, so that you can stay home if you're positive or you know avoid seeing uh, uh, people, um, then I think they'll, then the public health benefits overall, um, you know, exceed some of my concerns. Thanks, Jennifer. And, and a second question for you. So we're now at a moment where we see um, in some places community transmission that seems to be flat or maybe a, a tiny bit rising. We also hear about positivity rates maybe trending downward. How, how do we reconcile these different metrics? Well, we always have to look at multiple metrics, and I think we look for trends in multiple metrics to see what's going on. Each of these metrics tells us something slightly different. Um, testing is usually one of the, the earlier indications that we may be having a problem, but it's um, subject to limitations. Like if people are largely getting tested in their own homes, then we're not going to see that in our data and we're going to potentially have blind spots. Nonetheless, when we see a rising test positivity that tells us that we better start casting a wider net to find infections because we're missing a lot of transmission. People are missing the opportunity to stay home. Um, cases are the results of the, posit of the positive tests that do get reported. Um, so when we see increases in that, we wanna understand why that is. In the era of vaccination though, I am very, very interested in hospitalizations and deaths because this is what we're using vaccines to do. So I look at that above all. I think it is highly possible and I think we're seeing that in some places where you'll see the case numbers continue to creep up, but you don't see a, a um, sustained increase in hospitalizations or deaths over you know enough time to allow those metrics to catch up. Um, if you start to see that, I think I personally start to feel a little bit better. It means the vaccines, I think, are doing what we need them to do. And I think our, our social worries are far less than when we also see a rise in hospitalizations and we see a rise in deaths. Um, we're not there yet in the U.S. I would like us to get to that point. And I think if we do a good enough job of vaccinating people, eventually we'll stop. I won't say entirely stop, but we will look less at cases and testing numbers um, and, and continue to focus on hospitalizations and deaths. We're not there yet, but I hope we can be. Thanks, Jennifer. And we are just at 1230, so I'm going to wrap. I'd like to thank Jennifer Nezzo and Bill Moss for joining me today and give a big thank you to our audience and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, we will offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. Our next briefing will be next Friday, September 10th at 12. As always, in each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll have live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30-minute briefing. Until then, thanks and stay safe.